Sorry, we're just technical interruption. Yeah. So this is to record me, yes, and this right. is so people in the room can hear me. If I just talk like that, can you hear me at the back? Great, because there's no, you can't. So you'd rather I did that? Right, okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, right, well, it's nice to be in Yorkshire. Um, it feels very stand-up. <laughs> uh, it's lovely to be back in Yorkshire. Um, uh, last time I was in Yorkshire talking to a bunch of uh, history teachers was at the Historical Association Conference in 2013 and uh, it was a nice large audience, about 400 people. The talk went very well, you know how it is when you do a good lesson and afterwards we all piled out into the corridor to go to another room where I could sign books. So I was feeling pretty good about myself until I was walking to, along that corridor between two local ladies who were quite elderly and one of them turned to the other and said, he were quite full of himself weren't he? <laughs> So, uh, it's in all humility I come before you this afternoon to talk about bad histories of the Norman Conquest. Um, it's a talk I've only given once before to a much smaller group of school teachers, and I think they found it useful. But I, I think they also thought me very angry. Because um, it contains some ideas which are quite contentious, um, and, and some things I've obviously had on my chest for some time and I'm determined to get off. So, in brief, this talk is a response to the notion that the wrong side won in 1066, that the English are the good guys and the Normans are the bad guys, that the Anglo-Saxons are us and the Normans are them. Now, in my experience, these, these uh, ideas are rarely found in academia, and I don't even think I encountered them when I studied the conquest at school, though my memory on that subject is somewhat fuzzy. Um, I can remember encountering them, I think, for the first time in 1995 when I took a group of fellow students down to Battle Abbey, and that's my first slide, whoever's got the clicker. Um, okay. When I took a group of students down to Battle Abbey to watch the annual reenactment of the Battle of Hastings, and listening to the commentary over the tannoy, I was left in no doubt that I was supposed to be supporting the team that was about to lose. But since writing my own book on the conquest, Thank you. I've encountered this attitude more and more. Last year, for example, uh, I gave a talk about um, 1066 as part of a double bill, and I listened to another talk which might as well have been called Good King Harold. So I set out to investigate this notion by reading popular books on the Norman Conquest. Uh, I borrowed children's books and adult books from my local library, and by and large, the children's books were pretty commendable. They were academically up to the minute, at least at the time they were published, and usually given a once-over by academic historians. The books aimed at adults, to put it as mildly as I possibly can, were not so good. And for the purposes of this paper, I've decided to limit my discussion to just three of them, which seem to be the most popular. So if we have the first one... Uh, coincidentally, they all share the same title. They're all called 1066, though each has a different subtitle. The first up is 1066, The Year of the Conquest by David Howarth, published in 1977. The second is... we go back one? Sorry. That, one. that middle one, yeah. The second is 1066, The Year of Three Battles by Frank McClynn, published in 1999. And the third is 1066... no? 1066... <laughs> A New History of the Norman Conquest by Peter Rex, published in 2009. Now, it's not just a title that these books share. By and large, the story they tell is pretty much the same. Its common themes are as follows. Theme 1. England before the conquest was an ideal state like Eden before the fall or perhaps Tolkien's Shire. <laughs> if we go on to the next slide... We back to David Howarth's book and you can see where the illustrator was taking his cue from. Uh, it had a kind of democracy. Its kings were elected. Its army was part-time and amateur. Its people were happy and bucolic. David Howarth, describing this pre-conquest paradise, describes England as having, quote, an air of pastoral innocence. Point two. If you want an embodiment of this English spirit, look no further than Earl Godwin, father of the future King Harold. Godwin is England incarnate, a man of unimpeachable character, possessed of integrity and humility. But, great as he is, he is but a shadow compared to his son Harold. Next slide. <laughs> Harold, I think this is from a cigarette card. <laughs> Harold is really nothing less than a superhero. A supremely skilled politician, he is popular with all ranks of men. A great warrior, he also understands the pity of war and tries to limit bloodshed whenever possible. A man of passion, 
He chooses his life partner for reasons of pure love. <laughs> Selfless and guileless, he is surprised when the English crown is offered to him in 1066 and accepts it only out of patriotic duty. <laughs> On the other side of the Channel, however, is Normandy. Normandy is a very different place. In brief, you wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> its people are primitive, even barbarous, and as such, Normandy tends forever towards anarchy. Every landowner has his castle, and there is little or nothing in the way of law and order. All that exists is the iron will of their autocratic duke. <laughs> that duke from 1035 to 1066, well, I should say 1086, 1087, uh, was William, sometimes known as the Conqueror, but we will be calling him the Bastard. <laughs> Unusually cruel and harsh, William is forever hacking off people's limbs and gouging out their eyes. When he and his fellow Normans go to war, they do so with relish, taking no prisoners, raping and pillaging their way across the countryside, indulging themselves in an orgy of execution. Obviously, it would have been best for England to have nothing to do with Normandy, but alas, for the English, in 1042, they end up with Edward the Confessor. Now, Edward is also awful, but in a quite different way to William. In short, he is a nutter. <laughs> a few of the words from those three books. Devious, deranged, a purblind fanatic, a man of sudden whims and cruel humour, a vindictive and irrational man. These are some of the words used to describe him. Probably a closet homosexual, according to Howarth and McLean. Edward grew up in Normandy and favours the Normans. You might think this would make the claim that he promised Eng the English succession to William the Conqueror more credible, having grown up in Normandy. But you'd be wrong. Because Edward never promised the throne to William. He can't have done, he couldn't have done, and if he did, he didn't mean to. <laughs> and if he, didn't mean, if he did mean to, he must have changed his mind because on his deathbed he unequivocally granted the kingdom to Harold. This is not a matter of debate, it's a matter of fact. <laughs> Harold was not just nominated by Edward, he was also the people's choice, elected unanimously by the English people. But naturally this isn't good enough for the cruel scheming autocrat who lurks across the channel. William assembles a crack invasion force, next slide, and lies to the, pe the Pope to get bogus spiritual sanction. Actually, next slide as well, that's Edward, that's that one we want. He uses other kinds of dirty tricks too. Cavalry, <laughs> archers, crossbows, all of which real men shun. <laughs> they invade England and beat Harold, but Harold can't really be blamed for losing because he was quite tired from having to fight the Vikings three weeks earlier. <laughs> Probably a bit depressed as well. That's in Haworth. In normal circumstances, Harold could have beaten the Normans easy. So next slide. The end result is calamity, disaster, apocalypse. England has fallen, paradise is lost, Sauron has the ring. <laughs> but if the book has a coda, and we go to the next slide, we realise it will eventually all turn out okay because ultimately good will prevail. The English, the English language and Englishness survive and triumph. Now, in case I haven't laid it on too thickly with my trowel, I think this is a bit of a travesty. It's not history, it's ideology, ideology masquerading as history. And worse, it's a kind of ideological comfort blanket for an unthinking and at times noxious form of English nationalism. Let's shelve for a moment the idea of pre-conquest England as an ideal state and focus instead on its greater citizens, i.e. Earl Godwin and his sons, the Godwin sons. To remind you, and I'm sure you don't need reminding, but just to refresh your memories, of the salient fact, Godwin rose from nowhere to become Earl of Wessex during the reign of King Canute. He was the most important man in England after the king himself and maintained that position during the reigns of Canute's two short-lived sons, Arthur Canute and Harold, and during the first half of the reign of Edward the Confessor. He was, in Howard's words, the most English of Englishmen. Hearty, pragmatic, extrovert, a man who displays remarkable patience and loyalty in dealing with the hugely irritating Edward the Confessor. In Frank McLean's book, Godwin is dauntless, an astute politician, a real politicker, who gives sensible advice, which Edward rejects. How do these historians know this? How do these authors compose such a vivid portrait of a man who has been dead for almost a millennium? Our sources for this period are generally risibly thin. 
In the case of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, you're lucky if you get anything in the way of description. In the case of Harold Harefoot, who reigned, ruled England for five years, between 1035 and 1040, we don't even have so much as a single adjective. The answer as to why these authors can produce such vivid pen portraits of Earl Godwin is because they're reliant on a source called the Vita Eduardi Regis, which is my next slide. Um, you can obtain this from um, Oxford Medieval Text for I think about £180 in hardback, so it's hard to come by. Uh, the Vita Eduardi Regis, or as it's translated here, the life of King Edward. In this document, Godwin does indeed bestride the world like a benign colossus. He is moderate, reasonable, kind, wise, brave and selfless. All the things that his latter-day admirers contend he is. The problem is that the life of King Edward is far from being a dispassionate source. It's not even a biography of Edward in any meaningful sense. It's a political tract, a piece of propaganda written between 1065 and 1067 with one overriding aim, which was to praise and defend the family of Godwin. It was commissioned by Edward's queen, Edith, who was also, coincidentally, Godwin's daughter almost certainly to justify the kind of transfer of power that eventually happened in te January 1066, when Edward died and Harold Godwinson was crowned as his replacement. So, it should come as no surprise that a piece of writing created solely for the purpose of putting across the Godwin side of the story should portray the paterfamilias as a benign demigod and all his children as paragons of virtue. Not only is Godwin the saviour and father of his nation in this book, Edith, his daughter, Edward's queen, Edith is described as inferior to none, superior to all, recommended by the distinction of her family and the ineffable beauty of her surpassing youth. Her brother Tostig, who became Earl of Northumbria and of course played a crucial role in the events of 1065-1066, Tostig is a man of great courage, endowed with great wisdom and shrewdness of mind. But, of course, it's his older brother, Harold, who outshines them all. A true friend of his race and people, says the life of King Edward, he wielded his father's powers with even more activity and walked in the ways of patience and mercy. When Harold succeeded his father of Essex in 1053, the whole English host breathed again and was consoled for its loss. Nor is it surprising that the author of the life should denigrate the Godwin's political opponents. It's from its pages that we get the impression of the confessor as volatile, unreasonable and irascible. Qualities which are of course foregrounded when Edward forces, the Godwin, forces Godwin and his sons into exile in 1051 and banishes Edith to a nunnery. What is surprising, to me at least, is that modern writers should parrot the views expressed in the life as if they were sober, impartial reportage, somehow representative of the views of all 11th century Englishmen, rather than the views of a particular family or clan. Quote from Frank McLean here, it is important to be clear that it was Edward who precipitated the crisis of 1051, he says, and that in the words of his biographer, i.e., the life of King Edward, he provoked Godwin beyond endurance. When the life compares Godwin and Edward to the biblical kings David and Saul, McLean con concludes that a general consensus was forming that Godwin was a kind of David ranged against Edward's Saul. David Howarth, meanwhile, cautions us that in assessing Harold Godwinson we have to steer a path between his Norman detractors and later English sources which heap praise on Harold's head. The middle path turns out to be the life of King Edward, which, quote, leaves an impression of Harold which one can only think is much closer to the truth. Harold is a very capable man, patient, friendly, tolerant, good-humoured and easygoing by nature. The fact that McLean and Howarth take the life story entirely at face value, accounts not only for their sympathetic portrayal of the Godwin family, it also accounts for their roseate impression of life in England during Edward the Confessor's reign. Once Godwin and his sons have forced their way back from exile in 1052 and reimposed their will on Edward, says the life, there was deep joy both at court and in the whole country 
And so, with the kingdom made safe on all sides by these nobles, the most kindly Edward passed his life in security and peace. Total credence of the life leads both uh, Maclean and Howard to conclude that the Godwins can do no wrong, so their natural enemies must be the ones at fault. Thus, Elfgar, the Earl of Mercia, who objected to the rise of the Godwinsons during the 1050s, is described by Howarth as a permanently troublesome Earl and is lambasted for his disgraceful behaviour. When Tostig Godwinson, I love this one, when Tostig Godwinson provokes the people of Northumbria to rise up against him in 1065, Frank McLean is quick to acquit the Earl of any blame. Tostig's primary concern was justice. What irked them was that Tostig had an efficient system of taxation based on equality. <laughs> ah, dear. Uh, <laughs> tax reformer God, uh, Tostig. Most telling of all is the anxiety of both orders, authors to absolve Godwin himself from any responsibility for the murder of Edward the Confessor's brother, which you'll probably recall happened in 1036. The life naturally protests Godwin's innocence, but other sources, contemporary sources, blame him explicitly for Alfred's death. One version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for example, accuses him directly, and even the pro-Godwin version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the E version, simply excises the Earl's name from its account. But both Howard and Howarth and McLean expend considerable effort seeking to absolve Godwin. Any suggestion that he was responsible for Alfred's death, they insist, is simply Norman propaganda. Which leads me to a little side note on propaganda. Here's the thing about propaganda in these three books. It is a purely continental phenomenon. <laughs> in Frank McLean's book, for example, the word propaganda occurs over 20 times. It is used once to describe a Danish source. It is used another time to describe a French source. At all other times, the word propaganda or propagandist are accompanied by the word Norman. <laughs> the same is true in Howard's book, where we hear about Norman propaganda on nine occasions, but not once is the term applied to describe an English source, like, for example, the life of King Edward. Peter Rex's book is, alas, not searchable online, so I can't provide you with any detailed statistics, and I'm certainly not going to read it again in order to produce them. <laughs> But I think we can surmise his attitude when he describes our two principal Norman sources, William of Jumiège and William of Poitiers, as docked Goebbels with two heads. <laughs> the simple truth is that all sources for this period are, to some extent, propaganda. Even the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is often treated like some impartial rolling news feed of events, the facts of the reign are in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, says David Howarth at one point, even the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle has pronounced political sympathies called Norman propaganda English facts. <laughs> right, just pause there for a second. Right, I'm going to go on to talking about Williams or the claim to the throne in 1066. So, if we go on to a, I've got a picture, I think, here, first time in ages. Um, Let's turn to consider the conflicting claims to the throne in 1066. As you'll remember, the argument starts 15 years earlier, in the year 1051. According to Norman sources, it was in this year that Edward the Confessor promised the English succession to the future William the Conqueror. But no contemporary English source admits this happened, and so doubt abounds. William of Malmesbury, another chronicler writing about half a century later, uh, after the event, found it impossible to say for certain what had happened in 1051. I should like to warn the reader, he says in his account of that year, that here I perceive the course of my narrative to be somewhat in doubt, because the truth of the facts is in suspense and uncertain. To this day, some very eminent scholars remain unconvinced by the Norman claim, but I think it's fair to say that most of them accept that in that year, Edward the Confessor did promise the succession of England to William of Normandy. This incenses our three popular writers almost to the point of apoplexy. Unable to prove that it did not happen, they spend pages trying to tie themselves in logical knots, trying to explain why it shouldn't have happened or why it couldn't have happened. Peter Rex, for instance, tries for legal precedent. There was, he claims, a long-standing tradition, tradition that only legitimately born claimants could be recognised in England, citing the words of a synod of 787, 
but ignoring the election of Canute's bastard son, Harold, in 1035. <laughs> Elsewhere, Rex tries to construct an argument from silence. There is no evidence that King Edward ever made any public declaration in favour of the Duke, other than Norman assertions, and had he done so, it would surely have been recorded in the Chronicle. Nor was there a written will, since, had it existed, William would surely have produced it. I just can't even begin with the sort of logic of that statement. An alternative approach is to admit that something may have been said about the throne in 1051, but to assume that it was vague and inconsequential, a stupid mistake on the part of the soft-brained confessor. Possibly Edward didn't, did not mean to make a binding promise, writes Howarth. He might have made some informal, unbinding promise, says Frank McLean. The possibility that Edward did mean to make a binding promise in each case is left unexplored. Next slide, please. Harold's trip to Normandy, which, during which he reiterated Edward's promise, generally dated to uh, 10, uh, 1064 and famously depicted on the tapestry, received similar treatment. We are invited to consider that it might not have happened at all, in spite of overwhelming evidence in both English and Norman sources that it did. We are assured that if it did happen, Normandy was clearly not Harold's intended destination. He was either on a fishing trip in the Channel and blown off course, or else engaged in the kind of cunning diplomacy that is attributed to him in the life of King Edward. Uh, I think we've got another slide. When it comes to 1066 itself, however, there is no doubt whatsoever. Edward the Confessor unambiguously granted the throne to Harold Godwinson. According to Peter Rex, uh, uh, all the sources accept that the king directly bequeathed the crown to Harold. David Howarth agrees. The dying words of the king left no doubt whatever in the minds of the people who heard him. There is no suggestion in any chronicle that the choice was not unanimous. Frank McLean says, all the English sources make it crystal clear that Edward named Harold as his successor. But William's apologists tried, and some do so even today, to deny the obvious. Well, call me a Norman apologist, but... <laughs> the obvious on inspection seems anything but. In the first place, we have an extended account of uh, Edward's deathbed scene in the life of King Edward. In that scene, the bequest of the kingdom is described in a remarkably casual and ambiguous way. Edward is shown to be chiefly concerned with the welfare of his queen, who, le lest we forget, commissioned this particular source. Having praised her for one last time, he turns to Harold and says, I commend this woman and the entire kingdom to your protection. That's it. That's his promise of the throne. Nor is the life alone in using such, such guarded language. If I could have the next slide. This is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle E. This is the pro-Godwin version. Earl Harold succeeded to the Kingdom of England just as the King had granted it to him and also men chose him for it. Whereas the other versions of the Chronicle say angels bore Edward's righteous soul within heaven's light, yet did the wise King entrust his kingdom to a man of high rank, to Harold himself. So no mention of election and a significant verbal weakening from granted to entrusting, implying that Harold may have been empowered to take care of the kingdom as perhaps a temporary measure. Contrary what Frank, to, to what Frank McLean says, when we look closely at the events of Harold's succession, it seems fairly obvious that what we are looking at is a coup, albeit a coup supported by a very dominant faction within the kingdom. I might skip a bit here because this looks very tedious. Um, <laughs> I think the most telling thing from my point of view, if we go on to the next slide, is that Harold is crowned the very next day after Edward's death. Um, all previous coronations in England had been unhurried affairs. For example, Edward the Confessor himself was uh, elected king in June 1042, but not crowned until April 1043, a full eight, nine months later. Coronation prior to the conquest was simply confirmation. It, conferred, it didn't confer the kingship, it just gave you God's blessing. As such, they normally took place many months later, as I've said. Harold's rush to have himself crowned the day after Edward's death is therefore the most obviously suspect act in the drama. Moreover, it's simply not true to claim that all the sources are unanimous in endorsing the Godwin version of events. Going back to William of Malmesbury, writing 50 or 60 years later, he wrote that Harold had seized the throne, having first exacted an oath of loyalty from the chief nobles. Now, 
to, to be clear here, Malmesbury is not a, an anti-Harold source. He is actually quite... He's half English and half Norman, William of Malmesbury. He was hardly hostile. In the same paragraph that he says this, he praises Harold as a man of prudence and fortitude and notes that the English claimed the Earl had been granted the throne by Edward. But I think, he adds, that this claim rests more on goodwill than judgment. For it makes the confessor pass on his inheritance to a man of whose influence he had always been suspicious. More revealing still is an account written in the 1090s for Baldwin, abbot, abbot of Bury St Edwin, Edmunds, who describes Harold's hasty coronation as sacrilegious and accused the Earl of taking the throne with cunning force. Since Baldwin had been formerly Edward the Confessor's physician and was therefore likely to have been present at his death, this testimony ought to be accorded considerable weight. I'm going to skip the next bit because I think we're getting short of time. So that's Battle Abbey, which I was going to rant about, but we'll go on to the next thing I'm going to rant about. <laughs> um, what I do want to discuss for the remainder of the paper is the nature of the conquest that followed the Battle of Hastings. Uh, and I think, no, we'll leave it on that slide. In each of our three books, the conquest is a disaster for which no words are adequate. Now, I, I, another parenthetical comment from me. Let me be clear. England was transformed by the Norman Conquest. Its aristocracy was completely removed, even down to a very low level. The hierarchy of the church was swept away so that no bishoprics or great monasteries remained in English hands. The tenurial map of England was torn up and the country was filled with castles. At least 500 castles are reckoned to have been constructed in the first generation after 1066. It was, in the words of the bona fide historian George Garnet, Professor George Garnet, a change of magnitude and at a speed unparalleled in English history. For those who lived through the conquest, it was both a terrifying experience and a tragedy. And yet, in describing this period of fascinating, violent, complex change, all of our three authors contrived to miss the changes that really mattered, preferring to dwell instead on aspects of the conquest which they imagined to be novel, but which in reality were not novel at all. Uh, now the pick. Oh, can we go back one? Sorry, that's the one we should have. In describing the methods and morals of the Normans in warfare, for example, all three see a retreat from the more civilised standards previously maintained in England. The peaceable, guileless English have been conquered by Norman barbarians. <coughs> but in maintaining this line, they betray their ignorance of both societies and a lack of wider historical awareness. McLean, for instance, describes how William's invasion force, after landing in Pe Pevensey, plundered the surrounding countryside, before adding, this was England's first taste of harrying. Uh, the harrying mentality that had already made the Normans dreaded in Europe and would later make their name a byword for barbarism and savagery. This rather ignores the fact that harrying, i.e. deliberately destroying the landed resources of your enemy, was standard medieval practice when it came to making war. The main and principal point in war, said the Roman author Vegetius in his De Re Militari, which was the standard medieval handbook on how to conduct war, the main aim was to secure plenty of provisions for oneself and to destroy the enemy by famine. More to the point, to claim that the arrival of the Normans heralded the introduction of harrying ignores all the other parts of the conquest narrative, such as, for example, half the Canute sending his house cars to harry Worcestershire in 1041, or Edward the Confessor ordering Godwin to harry Dover in 1051. Most of all, it ignores the fact that England had already experienced long decades of harrying at the hands of the Vikings. McLean contrived to see none of this. All he sees is an army practising a new kind of warfare on the express orders of a grim tyrant, William the Conqueror himself, who he regards as a man of extraordinary cruelty. Uh, another quote, William's troops often looted, raped and pillaged their way through towns with his consent. This was no question of licentious soldiery being out of control. Again, well, there's nothing new in any of this. What was unique after the conquest was that William took steps to atone for and where necessary try to limit the violence that his troops inflicted. 
In the first place, we have the so-called penitential ordinance, a document drawn up by the Norman church in the immediate wake of the Hastings campaign, detailing the penances that those involved in the campaign were to perform, depending on the amount of blood they had shed. We also know that William took stern line on rape because the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, not a friendly source, praises his policy of castrating convicted rapists. I just want to kind of clarify here, because I know I'm reading from a script, for which my apologies, but don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the Normans were nice at this point, I'm just saying it's extraordinary that we have documents in which they sought to atone for shedding blood. You, you can't find similar documents where the, the Vikings beat themselves up about the number of people they killed or raped. McLean is not alone in seeing William as unusually cruel and morally inferior to his English contemporaries. He was a more barbarous and primitive man than either Edward or Harold, says David Howarth, adding charitably, but he's not to be blamed because he came from a more primitive and barbarous country. Peter Rex, meanwhile, averts that the English would have been terrified of William because he had a reputation for treating those who he captured in war with great severity. Did he? The significant point here, missed by Rex himself, is the word captured. If we ask the question, what did William do with those he defeated, there are various answers. One answer, perhaps the most common in England after the conquest, was that he sold them back their lands in return from, for a profession of obedience. How magnanimous, scoffs Peter Rex, and expects us to laugh with him. But we can only laugh at him because... Compared to what had normally happened in England before the conquest, such a policy was both extraordinarily magnanimous and strikingly new. The standard practice in pre-conquest England had been to lop people's heads off. I always say this when I give a more general talk to schools and teachers on the conquest, is, you know, if you ever find yourself in the circumstances of thinking about surrendering to a Viking or an Anglo-Saxon, don't. <laughs> Keep running. <laughs> um, we see in the multiple purges at the court of Ethelred the Unready and in the aristocratic bloodbath that attended the start of Canute's reign. We see it in the way Earl Godwin did away with Edward the Confessor's brother Alfred and in the way his son Tostig arranged the deaths of his enemies in Northumbria after promising them safe conduct. We even see it in the case of Harold Godwinson. One of the funniest things in our three books is the way they harp on about Harold's supposed restraint in prosecuting warfare but then he praise upon him for the way he deals with Wales in 1063. Harold met violence with violence, infuses Frank McLean in a typically laudatory passage. Every Welsh male who's resisted by so much as a flicker of an eyebrow was summarily executed. So they very much have their cake and eat it. Mm -hmm. Will now, on to my next slide please, the mutilation bit. That's the best I could do for mutilation, the border of the bio tapestry. Now, William, it's true, sometimes ordered the mutilation of those who rebelled against him, most famously during his attack on Alençon, when he's only Duke of Normandy, and later as King of England after the Siege of Ely. And naturally, his modern detractors make much of this, despite the fact that his contemporaries, the ones I've just listed, Godwin, Canute, Tostig, etc., did exactly the same. But what the detractors again miss is the fact that William did not execute those he defeated. Sometimes he forgave them and restored them to power, other times he imprisoned them. This last imprisonment, it turns out, is what Peter Rex bases his estimate of William's severity on. A comment by a contemporary French writer that the Duke never released his prisoners. The fact that William imprisoned his enemies at all, rather than lopping their heads off, escapes Rex's attention. The truth is, England and Normandy did have quite different attitudes towards human life, and as we would see it today, it was the Normans who were more civilised in that they spared their opponents when they had them on their knees begging for mercy. The Normans, in short, were chivalrous, and the English were not. In pre-conquest England, killing was accepted as a matter of course, a useful and necessary part of the political process. This was not the same in pre-conquest Normandy, where the practice had fallen out of fashion during William's own lifetime. And in England after the conquest, it fell out of fashion too. No man dared slay another, said the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in its obituary of William the Conqueror, no matter what wrong he might have done him. 
Only one man of consequence, Earl Waltheof, was deliberately killed after the Norman takeover, and he is the exception that proves the rule. Waltheof was executed outside Winchester in 1076. The next Earl to be executed in England after that was the Earl of Athol, who was executed in 1306. The Norman Conquest, in other words, ushered in 230 years of chivalrous restraint. The great irony here is that whereas all three authors regard the Normans as barbarians, the Normans themselves and other continental observers use precisely that word, barbarous, to describe the English at the time of the Norman Conquest. The persistence of old school attitudes towards political killing was one reason why they regard, regarded the English as barbarians. Another was the prevalence of slavery. Next slide, please. Right, that's the best I can do for slavery, I'm afraid. Uh, slaves really don't get a look in, in the source material. They are sort of, you know, under the radar. So many slaves were ploughmen, so I put a picture of a ploughman. Right up to the eve of the conquest, England had been a slave-owning and slave-trading society. To be a slave was far, far worse than being a servile post-conquest peasant. Slaves were essentially human chattels. They could be sold, punished, and even killed by their masters, stoned to death if they were male, burned to death if they were female, and there were lots of them. Doomsday books suggest that pre-conquest England, in pre-conquest in pre England, at least 10% of the population were slaves, and one expert has recently suggested the number may in fact have been as high as 30%. In Normandy, by contrast, by 1066, slavery was a thing of the past. Back when the Normans had been Norsemen, Vikings, they too had owned and traded slaves. Rouen had been made as a great international slave market. But in the early decades of the 11th century, the practice had died out. And by William's day, some Normans, particularly churchmen, were actively condemning it. And accordingly, we witness a steep decline in slavery after the conquest. Where we can measure it in Doomsday Book, there is a 25% drop in the number of slaves in England. Skip that bit. Once again, this seismic social change, the death of slavery, is not something that any of our three authors dwell on at any length. I can't recall any references to slavery in Peter Rex's book. There certainly aren't any references to it in the index. Howarth has a short, a short section in which he tackles the subject using arguments employed and discredited since the 19th century. Slavery was probably in decline in England, it was used as a punishment for criminals, and perhaps to employ the simple-minded. The clear implication being that slavery was somehow beneficial to the slave. Frank McLean deals with English slavery in a, free, a few brisk sentences, concluding the extent and role of slavery in 11th century England is still much debated. In the rest of the book, whenever he writes of slavery, the examples are all non-English. We are assured, contrary to all evidence, that slavery was still practiced in Normandy during William's reign, and we are clearly expected to recoil in horror at his description of the Welsh attack on Hereford in 1055, when women were raped and led off with their children in ca into captivity. Clearly no Englishman would do such a thing. Curiously though, McClin when McClin describes Harold Godwinson's attack on Somerset in 1052, despite going into considerable detail, he doesn't spot the Anglo-Saxons Chronicles comment that the future king seized money, men, and cattle. This is the point about slavery in our sources for pre-conquest England. It doesn't say, gosh, wasn't slavery terrible? It's just in there very deep. It's so unconscious you almost miss it. He seized men and cattle. Now, I'm going to steer myself towards a conclusion. I'm not here to pass judgment on the... I always feel like I'm sort of saying the Normans, they're great, you know? which isn't my intention. I'm not here to pass judgment on the English or the Normans as they were in the 11th century. It's enough to note that these were two markedly different societies with very different moral codes and that the Norman conquest therefore created considerable friction and change. But if I have my next slide, I am however more than happy to pass judgment on the quality of popular history that's produced about the conquest. Not least because its exponents are so eager to pass sweeping judgments on the people in their stories. David Howarth says, if I'd been around at the time, I would have liked King Harold and heartily disliked Edward the Confessor. Frank McLean, commenting on the three competitors for the throne in 1066, insists that William the Conqueror was the most cunning, Harold Godwinson the most courageous, and Harold Hardrada the most flamboyant. 
as if such qualities could be recovered a thousand years later and plotted on a graph. Peter Rex, meanwhile, is quite convinced that the Norman Conquest would not have succeeded at all, even after the Battle of Hastings, if only the surviving English had shown a bit more backbone. <laughs> I confess to... ...against the Normans. The English fleet could have cut them off by blockading the Channel. Another army could have been raised from the north of the west. Quote, what was lacking was unity of purpose and leadership, and too many people were prepared to collaborate. To which the astonished reader can only respond, if only King Peter had been there to rally them. <laughs> Another trait all three authors share is their belief that they are overturning a conspiracy of silence, rewriting history from the point of view of the underdog, and overturning myths about the conquest that have reigned since 1066 itself. Rex, for example, writes of Norman propaganda, so effective that it impresses the minds of modern historians who are unable to free themselves from its insidious influence. Like me, I guess. They subscribe to the hoary misapprehension that history is always written by the victors, ignoring the fact that their contrary opinions are derived from the considerable mass of English sources that have survived. After the conquest, says Howarth, Norman voices were strident and English voices were subdued, which will come as a surprise to anyone who's ever read Admiral of Canterbury, John of Worcester, or indeed the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Elsewhere, Howarth opines that Harold Godwinson has received a bad press because he had no one to sing extravagant praises. A truly extraordinary assertion given that Harold's extensive eulogy in the life of King Edward is the basis of Howarth's own Rosiac portrait. The reality is. How did time? Sorry. Yeah, good 10 minutes. Good 10 minutes, yeah. Uh, the reality is that the English have been telling the story of the Norman Conquest on their own terms since at least the early 12th century. You may remember a few minutes ago I talked about William of Malmesbury and said the English say that Edward granted Harold the throne. It's clear that the English have been telling the story of the Conquest on their own terms since that time. In the later Middle Ages, when England was perpetually at war with France, think of, say, from the 1280s through to the 15th century, 200 years or so, during that time they would retell the story of the Normans through the distorting lens of their own Francophobia. The story was given a further twist in the 17th century when parliamentarians were looking for a golden age of English liberties and found it in the Anglo-Saxon period, and, it, and concluded that the absolutism of... Uh, I've already made that point. Um, but... The most influential retelling of the conquest narrative from the English point of view came in the late 19th century, with my next slide, uh, when Edward Augustus Freeman wrote his mammoth history of the Norman Conquest. It is five volumes and nigh on 2,000 pages. Sorry, 3,000 pages. Freeman's work was intended to be the last word, as you can imagine, on the subject. <laughs> It is still cited in serious academic discussion, not least, and I say this in all sincere, it's all sincerity, not least because it has voluminous appendices. It did go through all the chronicles. But Edward Augustus Freeman was a man of his age, fashionably Anglo-Saxon like Queen Victoria, and fiercely Protestant. His writing betrays a virulent hatred of all things French and anything associated with Rome. He was also racist to a degree that was exceptional even by Victorian standards. Writing home to a friend from a lecture tour in the US, I've never had a lecture tour in the US, <laughs> <laughs> writing home to a friend from a lecture tour in the US, he said that America was a fine place, but it would be finer still if, and I'm quoting, if every Irishman killed a Negro and was hanged for it. For Freeman, the Norman Conquest was about a, how a superior Teutonic race and culture was defeated, temporarily, by a patently inferior French one. The leitmotifs throughout this 3,000 word book are blood and language. It's an astonishing read, if you have three months spare. <laughs> Edward the Confessor is condemned for favouring Normans, quote, men utterly alien in language and feeling while the Godwins are praised for their supposed role in the promotion of German churchmen, men whose blood, speech and manners had not wholly lost the traces of ancient brotherhood. When the Godwins flee into exile in Flanders, Freeman explains that while the Count of Flanders himself was becoming rapidly French, the land had by no means lost its Teutonic character, 
And conversely, when Harold is beaten off in Somerset in 1052, Freeman suspects that this was possibly due to the prevalence of Celtic blood in that district. When the Godwins eventually return to England in triumph, their supporters rally from those purely Saxon lands, whence Britain had vanished and where the Dane had never set foot. All of which is to say, if you're going to follow Edward Augustus Freeman, please do so cautiously. In my own book, just for example, I discuss his influence in the introduction and cite him four times thereafter, twice to point out that his interpretation is at fault. Frank McLean cites Freeman 39 times, sometimes naming him with approval. Moreover, there are also numerous occasions when McLean follows Freeman without saying so. His account of how Harold visited Yorkshire after his coronation, for instance, is not based on the original sources cited in his footnotes, but lifted more or less verbatim from an extended description in Freeman's book, the source for which is nothing more than Freeman's own fertile imagination. Let me just go back to my three shooting targets. <laughs> Consciously or no, the spirit of Freeman continues to inform popular understanding of the conquest to this day. What resonates loudly through each of these three books, and any number of other popular works on the conquest, is an unshakable belief in the superiority of Anglo-Saxon culture and society. In each of these books we find the same equation. What's English is right, and what's right is English. Thus, in Howarth's account, Edward the Confessor's policy alters not according to whether or not the Godwin family have a hold on him, but according to how English Edward happens to be feeling at any particular moment. Peter Rex's sympathies can be adduced from the fact his book is dedicated to the memory of all those men and women who perished during the Norman conquest of England, and from the titles of his many other books. The English Resistance, The Underground War Against the Normans, William the Conqueror, The Bastard of Normandy, <laughs> The Last English King, The Life of Harold II, Harrywood, The Last Englishman. For Rex, clearly, Englishness died in 1066, and William is a bastard. So to conclude, it might seem unfair, or at least disproportionate, to have directed so much of this afternoon towards slamming these three books written by non-professionals, but that's my point. <laughs> <laughs> the lack of professionalism. These are books aiming to educate, I see them cited a lot on reading lists for teachers, and yet they are written by amateurs. For the most part, they are written from ignorance. At the same time, they are written with an agenda using impartial, immoderate language. We would not tolerate such writing in the case of, say, Nazi Germany, but it seems that any slapdash nonsense can be published about the 11th century because it was all a long time ago. No need for academic rigour, it's all a matter of opinion of whose side you are on, Norman or Saxon. To which I say, coppers. <laughs> in any period, with any sources, the same tests apply. Who wrote it? What was their agenda? Is it credible? Can it be corroborated? The same standards apply too. Don't construct arguments from silence. Don't scatter adjectives and adverbs around to describe historical figures like so much confetti. Don't construct personalities based on your own dubious misunderstanding of past events. Don't, for heaven's sake, do psychohistory. <coughs> it's not a case of one view versus another alternative view. Facts versus alternative facts. It's a case of good history versus bad history. What all these books have in common are they are extremely bad history. Shoddily researched, ill-informed yet hyper-opinionated, speculative and partisan. They all cherry-pick evidence to suit their preconceived prejudices and in the worst cases knowingly conflate or misrepresent their sources. Moreover, what underpins such books is an unthinking nationalism demonstrably informed by earlier generations of scholarship that was deeply racist. I think that's dangerous. And if you want to see the kind of thing it encourages, Google Englis, English with a C on the end, and see where you end up. To most people, I suspect, and most students, the Norman Conquest being nearly a millennium in the past doesn't matter very much, if at all. Who won or who lost is of little consequence. But if you consider the Anglo-Saxons, the English as they were a thousand years ago, to be your people, then naturally the Conquest continues to matter a great deal.
If for you Englishness is not a matter of having a common law or a common identity or a common culture, if for you, like Edward Augustus Freeman, Englishness is about blood and race and soil, if you are 100% certain that you are descended from those who were conquered in 1066 rather than the tens of thousands or conquerors, uh, of conquerors or any of the other hundreds of thousands of immigrants who have come to England during the centuries that followed, well, then you are going to be very upset about the Norman Conquest indeed. You can, however, find some consolation in having your warped worldview echoed in popular books about 1066, but not this one. <laughs> Forward. <laughs> right. It's okay. Okay, we've got five minutes if you have any questions. Right, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just take this opportunity to thank Mark for coming up um, to uh, teach me history icons today, and a big round of applause. Thank you for illuminating the Norman Conquest. Sort of, I'm, I'm noticing increasingly that we're focusing a lot, or at least the media is, on, on centenaries and other anniversaries and so on. Um, and often we see reinterpretations um, coming, coming about. Do you think that there is a benefit in that happening for the Norman Conquest, or do you think that that's just going to cause further problems? Do you mean 2066? Well, well even that, but they're, they're not <laughs> even going for centenaries and, and bicentenaries. It's it's almost sort of you know it's the three hundred and twenty fifth anniversary since. Mm. I don't know whether they help. To be, I mean, they probably do in that they generate more. You know, what what is it? More heat than noise, or more noise than heat? Which is good, noise or heat? But they they generate a certain amount of brouhaha. But what? Whether that leads to sort of re better academic scrutiny, I don't know. I mean, there was a lot of stuff with Magna Carta three or four years ago, um, and there were several conferences, so th that produced some really good new scholarship on Magna Carta. Edward I died in 1307. Couldn't he get anybody interested in when I had a book out in, 12, in uh, 2007? Uh, there was one academic conference at the University of Bangor, you know, Westminster Abbey, are you going to mark the centenary of this man who helped build you and is buried at the back? Nah. So it, I think it very much depends, you know. I think, I think in general terms, probably more noise is good, um, as long as kind of the, the historians don't get sort of lost in the racket. Yes. Um, I would just say, first of all, um, thank you for kind of stepping off the pure historian sort of podium and actually sort of poking a stick. Um, yeah, I was quite cross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I'll make no bones that I thoroughly approve of historians doing that. I'm just curious as to whether you've had conversations with other scholars of the period and whether they thought, oh, Mark, what are you doing here? Or are they just as easy to you as you to poke a stick out there? I don't think, I mean, this, I think this is true of most academic medievalists. I don't really think they bother with books that are under their radar. You know, I just don't think they would bother to read something like Peter Rex's 1066 book. If they'd read Howard's book, you know, Howard's book is 40 years old now, he was about 75 when he wrote it, so it's kind of like uh, collecting dust on the sort of public library shelves. But there is a gulf, I think, between popular history and academic history. And um, I think it's kind of regrettable that when history books are reviewed, for example, I mean, some, all of those books have plaudits from national newspapers on the front. A, a splendid account of a, a difficult period, you know, those kind of things. If they're just reviewed by, you know, some hack who's been given a pile of books to get through, of course they're going to say, oh yeah, blood and thunder, you know, all good stuff. They're not going to say, this stinks of kind of 19th century racist scholarship. And I think, but I think, as I say, I feel as a medievalist, kind of my period is all kind of, it's a long time ago and it's all just kind of Monty Python. I don't <laughs> think they would behave that way with, say, something about socialism in the 30s, you know. So I think there's a tendency to give greater scrutiny in the popular press to um, history books, uh, the modern history books, than medieval ones. That's just my perception. Right. <laughs>
uh, yeah, people anxious to pull me off. Take the slides. Oh, no, no, go for it, mate. Uh, Yeah. And when sort of starting point was that how will come back clear for his guys that was just one of the involvement in England. What's a good way to help the kids understand sort of the dog wing clown that, 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 that he comes from? Um I mean, I don't want to sound trite, but don't start with Frank McLean's book. I mean <laughs> I, think is, I think this is the thing. I um that if you start with secondary material that's so that, that has inherited all the biases of the source material, that's very hard. If you say, go and read this, it will give you a rough idea of what we're talking about. Um, I mean, obviously kind of reviewers and sensible adults don't spot that kind of bias. So if you're giving it to 11-year-olds, they're just going to think, I assume, this is, a, this is I'm being given facts here in this book. Um, it's a great pity that the life of King Edward, which, as I say, is where all this pro-Godwin stuff comes from, isn't available for less than £180. It's only about 60 pages long. Um, what I really wish Oxford Medieval Texts would do is put together a sort of teacher's handbook of sources with all the best bits from all the hugely expensive source material. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, really. But... Um, I think it's, it's just what I said at the beginning, not to start from, to start from the assumption that, uh, not to start with the assumption that these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. Okay, I think that really is it. <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, can we just say thank you to Mark Morris for what was an absolutely amazing talk. It's just as history teachers, we are also historians, and um, we all studied history, and the fact that so many historians are willing to be so giving of their time to further contribute to what we're giving in terms of a diet to younger students is absolutely fantastic. I do have to say, like, I hope I'm not like breaching GDPR here, but Mark has come all the way from Plymouth uh, for Folkestone. an hour, Folkestone, Folkestone close <laughs> enough. It's lower than Scotch Corner, that's where my geography goes to. <laughs> so it's come all the way from there for an hour and a half to go all the way back home just to come and speak to us. So can we give one final round of applause to Mark? I think the link between historians and history teachers is so, so important. I'm sure you'll all agree. And the fact that, again, as I said before, they're still giving them their time is amazing. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jacqueline Bryden. Um, you may or may not have seen a magnificent film which came out, Peter Liu. Um, and Jacqueline was the historian who was the consultant for that film. So she provided kind of the research for that. And she's very kindly come today to give us her kind of story about um, what she does and Peter Liu. It's going to be really, really fantastic. Like, literally.